From our nation's capital, welcome to America's Drug Forum. I'm Randy Page. We depart today from our normal format to take the opportunity to speak at length with one of the nation's most influential thinkers of the 20th century, Professor Milton Friedman. Professor Friedman was the 1976 Nobel Prize recipient for economic science. He's a former economic advisor to President Ronald Reagan. And among his many lists of accomplishments, most recently, he is the recipient of the 1991 Richard Dennis Drug Peace Award for his consistent and controversial call for drug policy reform. Professor Friedman, thanks for being with us today. Glad to be with you. Let us deal first with the issue of legalization of drugs. How do you see America changing for the better under that system? I see America with half the number of prisons, half the number of prisoners, 10,000 fewer homicides a year, inner cities in which there's a chance for these poor people to live without being afraid for their lives, respectable citizens who are now, or citizens who might be respectable who are now addicts, not being subject to becoming criminals in order to get their drug, being able to uh, get drugs for which they're sure of the quality. You know, the same thing happened under prohibition of alcohol as is happening now. Under prohibition of alcohol, deaths from alcohol poisoning, from poisoning by uh, things that were mixed in with the alcohol, the illegal bootleg alcohol, went up sharply. Similarly, under drug prohibition, deaths from overdose, from adulterations, from adulterated substances have gone up. How would legalization adversely affect America, in your view? The one adverse effect that legalization might have is that there very likely would be more people taking drugs. That's not by any means clear. But if you legalized, you destroy the black market, the price of drugs would go down drastically. And as an economist, lower prices tend to generate some uh, more su demand. However, there's a, there are some very strong qualifications to be made for that. The effect of criminalization, of making drugs criminal, is to drive people from mild drugs to strong drugs. In what way? Well, you make, take marijuana. Marijuana is a very heavy, bulky substance, and therefore it's relatively easy to interdict. The, uh, the warriors on drugs have been more successful in interdicting marijuana than, let's say, cocaine. So marijuana prices have gone up. They've become harder to get. There's been an incentive to grow more potent marijuana. And people have been driven from marijuana to heroin or cocaine or one of the other, or crack, one of the other drugs. Let us consider another drug then, and that is the drug crack, yeah. crack cocaine. Crack would never have existed, in my opinion, if you had not had drug prohibition. It was drug prohibition. Well, why, did, why was crack created? Because cocaine was so expensive that the preferred method of taking cocaine... I'm not speaking from personal experience. I've never touched any of this stuff. I'm speaking from what I've read in, in the literature. But the preferred method of taking cocaine, which I understand was by sniffing it, snorting it, became very expensive. And they were desperate to find a way of packaging Young cocaine. entrepreneurs. Absolutely. <laughs> of course they're entrepreneurs. The, look, the people who are running the drug traffic, are no different from the rest of us, except that they are, have more entrepreneurial ability and less concern about not hurting other people. They're more irresponsible in that way. But they're in a business, and they're trying to make as much money as they can. And they discovered a good way to make money was to dilute this crack with baking soda or whatever else, I mean cocaine, whatever else they do, I don't mm -hmm. know the procedure, mm -hmm. so that they could bring it out in $5 and $10 doses. Let's talk about the, that more in a minute, but with regard to crack, considering the fact that it's very addictive, and considering the fact that... that that's, very, um, that's very dubious. It is addictive. But I understand from all the medical evidence that it's no more addictive than other drugs. In fact, the most addictive drug everybody acknowledges is tobacco. Well, let me rephrase that then. And all the information I've seen on it suggests that it is a drug which is very pleasurable. Absolutely. Let me put it that way. No doubt. And, and the, the effect of it is also very short. Yes. And it is very expensive because multiple doses cost a lot of money. My question is, if drugs were legalized and if crack cocaine were available at a low cost, could it not be devastating in that it is so pleasurable, I am told, that more people could get it and stay on it for longer periods of time. Well, maybe. Uh, nobody can say with certainty what will happen along those lines. But I think it's very dubious, because all of the experience with legal drugs 
is that there's a tendency for people to go from the stronger to the weaker and not the other way around. Just as you go from regular beer to light beer. Uh, hmm. That's the tendency that there is from, from uh, cigarettes without filters to, sil to low tar filtered cigarettes and so on. So, but I can't rule out that what you're saying might happen, but, and this is a very important but, the harm that would result from that would be much less than it is now for several reasons. The really main thing that bothers me about the crack is not what you're talking about. It's the crack babies. Because that's the real tragedy. They are innocent victims. They didn't choose to be crack babies anymore than the people who are born with a fetal alcohol syndrome. And as you know, we are already experiencing epidemic proportions of that. Many one out of four babies going into one hospital, I can tell you, in Maryland is addicted. But I'll tell you, it, it isn't that crack babies are necessarily addicted, but they tend to come in at low birth weight. They tend to come in at... Uh, and they have drugs in their system. They, and, and they are in other ways uh, mentally impaired and so on. But you know that the number of th who do that from alcohol is much greater. So the same problem arises there. But now, the reason I, that's what bothers me. Now, suppose you legalized. Under current circumstances, a mother who is, carry, who is a crack addict and is carrying a baby is afraid to go get treatment, afraid to go get prenatal treatment because she turned herself in as a criminal. She's subject to be thrown to jail. Under legalized drugs, that inhibition would be off. And you know, even crack addicts, mothers, have a feeling of responsibility to oh, their of children. Of and I have no doubt that under those circumstances, it would be possible to have a much more uh, effective system of prenatal care, a much more effective system of trying to persuade people who are on uh, drugs not to have children or to t go off drugs while they have children. Let us turn to the early genesis of your belief that the drug laws may not be working the way the nation would hope them to. Tell me about the elements that you saw early on that changed your mind or changed your way of thinking. Well, I'm not saying changed. I would rather say formed my way of thinking because I do not recall at any time that I was ever in favor of prohibition of either alcohol or drugs. I grew up, I'm old enough to have lived through a good po some part of the prohibition era. And you remember it? I remember. I remember the, the occasion when a a uh, fellow graduate student at Columbia from Sweden wanted to take me downtown to a restaurant where he had a Swedish meal and introduced me to the Swedish drink Aquavit. This was a restaurant at which this ch ch Swedish fellow had been getting Aquavit all during Prohibition. They had been selling it to him. And this was just after the repeal of Prohibition. And we went there and he asked them for some Aquavit. And he said, oh no, we haven't gotten our license yet. <laughs> and finally he talked to him in Swedish and persuaded them to take us into the back where the kitchen where they gave us a glass of aqua feet apiece. <laughs> now that shows the absurdity of it. During Prohibition, when I was a teenager, <clears throat> I, Prohibition was repealed in 1933 when I was 21 years old. So I was a teenager during most of Prohibition. Alcohol was readily available. Bootlegging was common. Any idea that alcohol Prohibition was keeping people from, from drinking was absurd. There were speakeasies all over the place, but more than that, we had this spect spectacle of Al Capone, of the hijackings, of the gang wars. Anybody was.